I will do things your way. I will do things your way. When you speak, Holy Spirit, I'll swiftly obey. I will do things your way. I will do things your way. I will do things your way. When you speak, Holy Spirit, I'll swiftly obey. I will do things your way. Anything you want. Anything you ask. Whatever you desire. Lord, just name the task. That's what I will do. Oh, that's what I will do, precious Holy Spirit. I'm in love with you. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love, I'm in love with you. Three things should confirm that you're making a good decision. One is peace. Peace. Your mind stops wanting to search and look. I think if something inside you is still wanting to to gather information, slow everything down to the speed of peace. Peace is a real instant, and you suddenly don't want to keep looking. Another is joy. Joy should be the instant reward for making a good decision. Third is the absence of fear. My friend, who's the captain of our police force, told me one time at supper, Captain Steve, he said, uh, fear is a protection emotion. That's really stayed with me. Because we think of fear as being bad, horrible. Get rid of that fear. Have faith. But there's another part of that. We know there's a fear of God, there's a reverence for God. A fear of man can be evil. But there is a fear that's a protection emotion. And it means your spirit's picking up something that, uh, that your mind hasn't picked up. In our time together here, at the, I call this the preacher's handbook. Decision-making is serious. One bad decision can last 10 years. You can pay for it a long time. What's the common mistakes we make? I've got a book on this. The common mistakes we make is lack of research. Advice from one of the most famous preachers in the world was from Rex Humbard to me. My early 30s, 34 or so, 35. He was really a blessing to me. He and his wife, Maud Amy. They pastored a great church called Cathedral of Tomorrow in uh, Akron, Ohio. I preached often for his sister and her husband, Louis Davison and Ruth who was in Parma, Ohio, Bethel. I think it was Bethel Temple. They had a great church, large church. But Rex Humbard was the first major TV preacher. I mean, everybody in the world knew him. He flew places. He was known for his simplicity of accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he completed every sermon. Thousands were saved under his ministry. But he told me one night at supper, he said, Brother Mike, the number one mistake in my ministry was not hiring 
a full-time researcher. I've wanted that. I've mentioned it a few times. I do not have a full-time researcher, and I would love to hire a full-time researcher. But your researcher has to have a personality that doesn't distract you, that doesn't break your focus, and doesn't want to talk to everybody in the room. So it's rare to find a good researcher. And there's reasons for that. Your mind is different. Your responsibilities and projects are much different. And a researcher needs to bring you information that you need instead of you go searching for it. A preacher's mind needs to be in prayer and uh, ideas, in my opinion. Not searching for how long does a lion sleep at night. It's really important to have a researcher. And uh, I would agree with him that that's one of the biggest mistakes that I have made in my life. You need a researcher. And let me explain why your time, when my ministry, why your time, the time, the mind of a preacher must be kept on proper things. Is it hard? It is for me. It is for me. And because uh, I'm thinking of so many different things. Did they do this? Did they finish that? Did they get that printed? Did they pay that? Did anybody review the invoice? Did anybody study that? Because it's 80% business, maybe 90. 168 hours in a week. And the average preacher preaches one hour a week out of the 168. Ministry is so much business, and no one wants to say that because it's a, it's a heart thing. But it's a, I mean, if I told you and went through the list of all the things that I cover, they're shocking. They're stunning. When our ministry reached 18 million a year, and I was a church evangelist. I wasn't a city evangelist. I'm not stadium material. I just went church to church to my pastors. That's my calling. When we reached 18 million a year, it dawned on me that every minute was, I was, I was every minute was, did we get that done? Did we do that? What happened to that? Oh, I noticed the other, just a few days back, we shipped thousands of books to a pastor to the wrong address. Well, that affects me. I want everything. I'm very accuracy oriented, but I'm also confirmation. I want verification of everything, everything. Well, so when my ministry reached 18 million, I thought, okay, we have 52 weeks in a year, two weeks for vacation, whoever takes that. That's 50 weeks left. 40 hours a week times 50 weeks is 2,000 hours. That's 9,000 dollars an hour. My bills were $9,000 an hour, which is $150 for one minute. That means eight hours a day, five days a week. Whatever I do has to end up, because everything ends up in the budget, everything. Your budget decides what you can do, what you got to stop doing, what you can no longer do, and it reveals all if there's any mistakes in your ministry, it's going to show up in the money. It's going to show up in the money. So I got to think about, okay, my time is $150 a minute. Couple came to my house, good people, sweet people, so anxious. To, you know, people think they're doing you a huge favor when they say, I'm going to take you out to a meal. I hear that a lot. And I know what they mean. It means they, they want to honor me, show they care, show they admire me. But see, my time at $9,000 an hour, that's a little too expensive. That's a little too expensive for a restaurant. In fact, going out to a restaurant is generally a most incredible 
loss and a waste of time, for sure. Going to buy groceries is a huge waste of time, unless you know how to make it count. Time management in the ministry is ferocious. It's very critical, very important. And not one person, including your family, has any concept of that. Nobody has seen your to-do list of 711 items. There's a popular saying, and it's real popular, that whatever you really want to do, you've got plenty of time to do. That's, that's about as foolish as God being in control of everything. Isn't that one of the most absurd things you ever heard? God's in control of everything. Rapes, murders, theft, deception. <laughs> God's in control of everything. Right. Millions of divorces. God's in control of everything. Isn't that a funny thing? So when this couple was hour and 45 minutes. And when we got back home, I thought, what on earth have I done? What have I done? And then I remembered Howard Hughes, the billionaire, brilliant man, had his own suite at the top of a hotel, and even his closest friends never saw him. His employees shoved paperwork and contracts under the door. Then I understood why Warren Buffett carries his little lunch bag. Now he is worth now about 139 billion. He, he reads six to eight hours a day. He goes to his office and he does nothing but read and draw in information. And he's worth 139 billion. He also had some, by the way, it's worth it's worth it to find why people do the things they do. Everything I do is pretty well based on time. Time management runs my world. Do I have time for that? No. And in the ministry, you'll find out you have to say no to a thousand things. Every yes will require a hundred no's in the ministry. If you say yes to one thing in the ministry, you have to say no to at least 100 other desires, requests, appointments, etc. Oh, I need one thing uh, on these. Yes, you think of everything. You Give me one second, family. I want to show you, because we're putting these booklets together for preachers. And hold on one second. I'm uh, giving her f some more. I'm so glad you thought of this too. Yay. Fabulous. Fabulous. Ministries have different goals. Or Roberts' ministry was very different than Billy Graham. Very different. Billy Graham, very different than John Osteen. Very different from Kenneth Hagin. And you want to manage that difference very carefully. What do I love? What do I want? I'm, you know, I'm stunned when I go to preachers and I say, let me see some of your books. Oh, I hadn't written one yet. I just hadn't had time. Well, you never have time. There is no time to write a book. You record everything you say when you teach your staff. Today I'm working on over 200 team talks that I want to put in booklets for pastors and preachers. And I'll come back to that. What are the key elements in your ministry? Number one, I mentioned earlier, your persuasion about God, the Word of God. Is the Bible really the 
infallible. You need the rhythm of of prayer. And don't try to, don't be tormented by demonic accusations that you don't pray enough. You will never feel like you pray enough. That's why you pray continuously. You pray continuously. And there's an A through Z list. I have a book called Seven Minutes with God. You use your energy to enter God's presence. Let him use his to keep you there. Don't be tormented because as long as you have needs and desires, and there's different parts of praying. There's praise. There's intercession. There's praying in the spirit. Fred Price, a man I admired greatly, said you should pray 60 minutes every morning, one hour in tongues. And I'll come back to that because um, the prayer language produces profound ideas you could never think of by asking for. You don't even know what to ask for. In fact, that's one of the reasons we pray in the Spirit so much is because we don't know exactly what we're supposed to be asking for. Your persuasion about God. I love all the scriptures. I shouldn't say that. That's not right. Some of them, some of them I don't like. Uh, I love all the faith scriptures. I love all the happy scriptures. There are some scriptures I don't like at all about his punishment of wicked people, etc., etc. I receive no pleasure from the destruction of evil people. I should, but I don't. There's a sorrow in me because we didn't reach them, you know. My favorite scripture has been Numbers 23, 19. God's not a man he should lie. My favorite scripture right now is Proverbs 3, 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And I could quote a few. You need a rhythm to your day. There are 12 ingredients I found important to a day. And the Lord really gave me this, that if I would make one day successful, find the ingredients for making one day successful. Find the ingredients. One of them is delegation. And you must delegate everything possible to someone you've had time to train. I made some decisions today in my mail department that were a little different. And I found out that in the five years I've been gone, they changed some of my protocols, things that I would consider really important. And someone else was in charge, and they changed, and they didn't know the reason why I code mail. If there's a great testimony... I want that. That's TF, testimony file. If I know of a preacher, he's a MF, minister friend. If he's a preacher but I don't know him, he's ML, minister list. Decision page. In the back of every one of the 23 million books I've given out around the world, there's a decision page. Every single one of my books is to have a decision page. I have accepted Christ reading this book, and then I let him order another gift book from me because those decisions, people that are saved under my ministry, are important. There's a time I want to say to my staff, I want to make a phone call to I'm very stirred to talk to people about their decision for Christ. And we have hundreds that have accepted Christ, so I want to make a phone tree just to them, my decision partner, someone who made a decision on my ministry. Two things are very important in mail ministry. One is customization, their name, their name through the letter. Four or five times it creates more I'm talking to you. Number two is segmentation. I don't write the same letter 
to someone who gave me $200 as I do to somebody who's never given me a penny in my life. There's a diff difference. What is wisdom? Recognizing difference. What is honor? Rewarding someone for their difference. What is understanding? Knowing the value of that difference. What is patience? The endurance of difference. Everything is around Proverbs 2, verses 5, 6, 12, and 16. Watch me carefully here if you can, please. Pastors don't work with mail letter ministry. Illustration. The pilot for Oral Roberts looked at him and says, I don't like forum letters sent to everybody. And Brother Roberts took his Bible and slapped his pilot, who was Kenneth Copeland, on the chest with his Bible and says, that's all the Bible is, is form letters. There's over 300 topics I'm going to be covering with you throughout the next seven days. Here in our little school of ministry, I'm calling the Preacher's Handbook. We talked about earlier, you must know your difference. How does God use you? Are you satisfied with the way God's using you? Because you will see pastors with churches of 18,000 people, and you say, my Lord, how do, how do they run 18,000? What if you listen to the pastors who run 18,000 in church, it's not always because they preach so inspirational, but they've managed to organize, stimulate, inspire people relationships. And people often don't go to a church because that pastor preached the good last week. They go because of the family in that church that they'll talk to and meet and their children will mix, etc. It's important for you to know how God uses you. What do you love to talk about, teach about? A preacher wrote me a couple of days ago. I've known for a long time. He said, how do you stay inspired to teach three or four hours every day? Well, I teach what I believe matters. I teach on things that I believe make a difference. And I'm not trying to reach the world. I come here at 12 and 5 every day because whoever has a passion for unusual kind of wisdom, and I don't mean, praise God, hallelujah, Jesus is coming soon. I'm talking about the 72 laws of life in the Bible, the law of focus, the law of adaptation, the law of two, the law of agreement, the law of new, the law of change. And there's 72 laws that we have talked about. Remember this, and always try to remember this. The gospel has two parts, the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. There are two different rewards. I've heard some people say, well, I just preach Jesus. I just preach Jesus. That's good. That's necessary. That's the heart of the gospel. But he doesn't even come close to being all the gospel. Not even close. All the Ten Commandments in Exodus were about one topic, honor. And as you go through the Bible, you'll see there's many topics. Jesus dressed in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. He talked about mercy. Then he gets over to another place and he talks about money. And the law of receiving, Luke 6, 38, 39, 40. Then he tells Peter, if you, uh, whatever money you give to the ministry, I'm going to give you some houses and lands a hundred times back for everything you gave. I'm going to give that back to you. Mark 10. There's so many parts of the gospel. Well, which part's most important? Wherever you're hurting. My teeth hurt. I don't call my cardiologist. When I needed help and had triple bypass, I didn't call my dentist. 
everyone solves a different kind of problem. And in the ministry, you want to identify what's the problem God wants me to solve. And usually in one of my wisdom keys, I say this, that a man's experience with God becomes his message to people. Or Roberts at 17 was dying of tuberculosis and stuttered, couldn't speak. God heals him and he brings this healing message to the world. How does God use you? One of the ways that you know in the ministry how God uses you is who are the people that respond to you. I began to find out that in all my, I had youth conferences. I took women's conferences, 16,000 women in Brazil, pastors conferences, evangelist conferences, speaking for missionaries and helping them start churches, 8,000 new churches in South Africa. We helped start through my tent, you know, my tent factory I built for all the preachers there orphanages, what's the present opportunity that you have? How does God want to use you now? Who responds to you? Who loves drinking at your fountain? Who stays at your well? Who is the Elisha? Whose greatest joy is to listen to you talk? So you must just see the, what has God opened to my life? What's God opened to my ministry? Let me stop for a moment. Brazil, Canada, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Rene, Pastor John in Canada. I wish we were able to see each other again sometime, Brother John. Julie, Baruch Vera, Tamara White in Canada, Mark Mays, Oklahoma City, Zachary Shaw is here, Jose Cancel. Jacques, God bless you. My bird, Violet, Leanne Smiles. Puerto Rico's here. It's a great place to preach to, Brother Fon. 5,000 people. Now, know your difference. What should you know in your ministry? Know your difference. Identify, yeah, yeah. I love both of them. She can put both of them on the screen, can't you? You want to put both of them? Amen. The Preacher's Handbook where I'm teaching tonight. Let's go back to time management. I've never met a poor man who managed time or valued time. I never met a millionaire that didn't keep looking at his watch. Or Roberts looked at me one day and tapped his watch. And he says, I live every hour of my life. Yay, there we are. Can you take away the, uh, oh, the seven minutes with God, by the way. Let me, while, while you're there, if you'd like a copy of that book, call the two numbers there, Seed and Book, 471. Uh, it's a rare kind of book. It's about 140 pages. $5 is fine. Book 472. I'll pay the shipping and handling. But I've got my prayers in there, A through Z, alphabetical, facts about the Holy Spirit. But talking about investing the first seven minutes with God every morning, coming into His presence, always beginning with Matthew 6. Always. When you come in His presence, and I really was convicted by the Holy Spirit saying some things I said. But the the... The Lord's Prayer doesn't sound zingy or spectacular, but it's the precise words of Jesus of Nazareth who told us the Father wants you to say these six layers or six subjects there in the Lord's Prayer. He wants you to say these words to Him. Our Father, Show in relationship. And then you can go into the, you know, all your Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sikhanu, Jehovah Shalom, 
You can go in all the names of God if you want to there. But take the simplicity of the Lord's Prayer. Take that simplicity in Matthew 6. And it says, this, these are the words that the creator of the universe would really like to hear you say. There's not one day I don't speak the Lord's Prayer up to five times a day. Once I know what the Holy Spirit wants me to say, that's exactly what I do. Pleasure decides favor. The amount of pleasure decides the amount of favor. The person you pleasure decides your favor. And favor decides your life success in your ministry. But old Roberts tapped his watch and he said, I live every hour of my life or every minute of my life by this one, by, by this. He tapped the time. Do you know how to manage time? Probably not. Probably not. The average person doesn't. They'll let someone dominate a meaningless conversation. Three times. I thought I would bring all my staff. We had about 15 work in my office, so I took them all to a, a Japan restaurant. They had not been there. And an hour and a half later, two hours, I went and got in my van. Everybody went home. One person, as I recall, thanked me for the mail. One person. My receipt was $550. And I couldn't tell you one meaningful minute the entire time we was there. I comforted myself, of course. Said, well, it was good for them all to be together. It was good for us all to feel at peace with each other and have some time of fellowship. Fellowship is rarely advantageous and beneficial. It's usually a break from something really critical and important. I'm just saying this from my heart because no man's fellowship with more people on the earth than I have. No man has. One night I decided I would take about 10 people out that was close to me. And I said, I really want to know them and I want to be, I, I want to see how, of course the meal was $1,100. The meal was $1,100. I couldn't tell you one valuable sentence the whole night. Another meal, same thing. One man dominated the whole conversation, joking about some trip he was on. And everybody, including preachers present, just stared at me. Not one question about the ministry asked. Not one person said, what are you learning? Not one person. The average person does not know how to make a conversation a valid, a valuable investment. Very few people know how to make moments impactful, useful, beneficial, corrective, very few. But in the ministry, I couldn't tell you how many times at the end of a service, I had this overflowing love in me. And I'd say to all the Wisdom Center, I'm bringing you today to Golden Corral. Everybody, I'm treating everybody. Next Sunday, I'm bringing you today to uh, uh, the Chinese, what's Asian King. The Chinese place. If I told you, and there was always, you know, about two or three people who would say, thank you for treating us today. We appreciate this, Brother Mike. Uh, I'm sure they did. But I'd lost so much money in it. And then later, it took me years, years to grasp 
that a $50 meal with two people who were serious learners advanced my ministry a hundred times more than just treating everybody together and people talking. Now, it had its rewards. You know, people met each other, talked to each other, got close to each other, and became better friends. But I'm talking about making decisions here. What are you going to do with your money? You got a hundred dollars worth. There's there's twenty things you can do with a hundred dollars. What are you going to do with it? And one day it dawned on me, you know, it really dawned on me what, how foolish it was. It's like, yeah, let me put it this way: you go to one store, and a T-shirt is forty-nine dollars. Another ninety-five dollars. You go to Hobby Lobby, it's two dollars and fifty cents. Go to Go to uh, Walmart, and it's two dollars and ninety cents. Same way with your time. Just like you, you make decisions. What can I do? What should I do? What can I do? What's what's the opportunity hidden in the present moment? What's the present opportunity? Powerful, isn't it? Let me stop for a moment. Take my breath. Violet says, I love to listen to your encouraging lectures. Leanne, this is powerful mentorship, time management. I'm learning and taking notes. Leanne, you, Leanne meditates on everything. I love your thoughts. Apostle Sonia, Hugh, Georgia Thomas, George, I prayed over your tithe today, twice, twice, twice. I have some thoughts. I held your tithe in my hand, Georgia, and I had two or three thoughts. I'll be sharing them with you by phone later. Tammy, Freddie, Teresa, Karen Renee, this teaching is valuable. I feel like it is. I feel like it is. You can remove the uh, seven minutes with God. I want them to see something. Book. The book's only $5. It is irreplaceable. No book like it. Seven minutes with God. Managing your time. In the ministry, nobody knows. My staff don't know I've answered 40 vibers in the first three or four hours of my day. While I'm praying in the Spirit, suddenly a preacher will write me. Very famous preacher just arrived two days ago, and everybody knows him all over the world. They know him. He has a 100 photographers meeting him when he lands at airports in London, England. And he wrote me, said, I'm going to be three days in Texas. Can I see you? I have things like that. I have to make a decision. Now, I would never want to meet with somebody if I could solve the problem through a phone. I would never want to talk to somebody if one of my staff can solve the problem through the phone. Develop time consciousness. I think about that a lot. I'm 76. My father died at 99. If I live five more years, what will I do? If I live 10 more years, what will I do? If I got the bloodline right and I got another 20 years, what will I do? I'm very, very sensitive about the investment of my time. Wasted time creates deep anxiety and anxiety in me. Wasted time creates a, a sorrow in me because I think of all the things. Right now I've got about, you know, a whole bunch of major things. I'm trying to finish a book for my one of my brothers. He sent me something and he wants me to put it in a book. I'm working with that, trying to get that for him. He's 80 years old. And I know for him, he's never had, he's never made one request from me in 80 years. I couldn't tell you one thing he ever asked for me to do for him. He's a very successful man. He's been in constant pain for 13 years. I could say maybe. It's the only thing he's ever asked me to do. And he sent me a pile of notes and said, would you put these in a book? He's got children. He's got grandchildren. That's been on my mind today, to hurry up and get that to the complete line because he will go. He will be gone, and if I don't do what I told him I would do, 
but he's never asked me. Only thing in all these years I could ever think my father, my brother ever asked me for is to help him finish a book. I say that for this. The requests that come to ministry, some are very vital, vital, valuable, important. Some are immediate. Some are not important at all. Two sentences can satisfy some things, some people. But in the ministry, time is so precious. That's why sometimes when I'm teaching, I always... I knew it was never wise to preach long. Never. Never. Good. They're spreading it all out. Good. I like to experiment. So I experimented with two restaurants a while ago and called in a whole bunch of stuff from two restaurants uh, just so the staff could all, you know, uh, experiment with it. All kind of new foods. All kind of new things. And so they've got it outside here. And they were, Sonia was just telling me. Uh, I like experimentation, exploring, testing. I test everything continuously. Is this what I like? Do I not like it? Do I want something different? I make a change the moment that I'm agitated. I make a change quickly if I know that it's lost. It's like food that's lost its savor. How do you save time? You must narrow down your goals. You must be able to walk away from some things you would like to do. I walk away from a lot of things I'd like to do. I like to flow with my, um, with my present interest because I know it may never come back again. I mentioned about going to a store and uh, I suddenly would felt like I needed to go to that store. It's one of my favorite stores, the container store. And I bought a number of things. I bought every, I buy everything that I have an interest in in a store. I don't have time to argue for 20 minutes. Where will I use this? Can I use this? If I know I like something, I'll buy it. I'll figure out where and when and who later. And that's just my style. If I go to a store, I go to every single aisle because they may have thought of something. Remember that every night, 8 billion, 46 million people try to think of new things every night, every day, 8 billion people. So when I do get to a store, I want to know everything they've thought about while I was asleep, while I was preaching. So I go up and down every single store. If I see an idea, they may have an idea that I could use that. I take a picture or I have my people take a picture. I never shop alone. There's too much to do. And you never want to waste that mo those moments. I bought a whole bunch of things. And when I got home, they unloaded them. I said, baby, I said, I bought a lot of things. I bought everything I like. I always buy everything I like. My mind's too important to waste it on. Well, maybe I'll come back next time. Maybe I'll get it next time. Are you kidding? My mind's too precious for that. My time's too rare for that. I'm not going to sit there and argue about a $10 difference if I go to the other store. I have friends who literally will drive five more miles because the gas is 10 cents less a gallon. My mind is a thousand times more important than my money. My thoughts, my ideas are a thousand times more important that we can come back next week and buy it next week. So this is my style, and I'm sharing this with you because I think it's valuable. It's valuable, which reminds me. The number one desire of Oral Roberts his last 30 years, his number one desire was to be able to walk through the stores in Tulsa without being recognized. That was his greatest desire when he was in his 70s and 80s. Same desire, the same guy had desire was Paul McCartney of the Beatle fame. He was worth 600 billion, I think it was. Million, 600 million. 
and they ask him, what's the greatest desire of your lifetime? And Paul McCartney of Beatle fame, you know, London, says, the greatest desire of my life is to be able to walk down the streets and nobody recognize me, nobody interrupt me. And that's something. Here's some basic truth in the ministry. Nobody has the same lifestyle. Nobody has the same desires. And what a lot of people don't realize that in one of the most powerful wisdom keys ever given to me by the Holy Spirit, desires expire. Desires expire. Got a hundred things I want to tell you. Can you tell? You need a gatekeeping system in the ministry. You got to. You got to, got to, got to, got to. You got to. You need a gatekeeping system. You must decide whose presence matters to you most. Not whose presence you make a difference. Whose presence feeds you? In the ministry, we require inspiration. Protection from agitation. We must identify collaboration. Who can we collaborate with? Roundtable discussions save thousands of dollars an hour. Identify the people whose conversation helps protect you. Not everybody can be a gatekeeper. There's already a group of people in your ministry who's trying to bring people in to meet you, know you. Sometimes it's fabulous, sometimes it's worthless. And you've got to train people. I'm working right now on my team talks. Uh, I taught the staff 286, 15 minutes. I taught my assistants hours and hours, and I videotaped it because video teaching is the most effective way to train your staff. When did I find that out? 20 years ago at 56 years old. That's where I found it out. Sit in front. Let me just give you this. Oh, I've got to cover some other things. False accusation, video training. Let me talk about this. I came back from, you know, I travel around the world, 36 countries. I preach up to 12 hours a day in conferences. Biggest, biggest churches in the world. Preaching churches that ran 250,000. Now they run 300,000. But I preached in churches that had 256,000 out in front of me. All those kind of stuff. I've been small, large, all of it. It's important in your ministry to identify who your receivers are. That's real critical. And be sure and shake the dust off your feet when you enter into an environment of disrespect and dishonor. Jesus didn't argue a lot. But he went to the Woman at the well, there's a woman who needs me. He went where he was needed, where he was heated. I've got a whole list of seven things. Needed, heated, believed, bleated, etc. But you must in the ministry identify difference in people and who's receiving you. I would rather talk to you right now here than to be talking to 250,000 people who weren't really receiving me. I want to spend the rest of my days with receivers, only receivers, and then the best receivers. I learned late to avoid all contentious people at any cost. And I can give you some bridge words. Here are some of the bridge words. Some of them I got from Casey Treat, a friend of mine in Seattle, Washington. You must escape the stressful conversation. God didn't call you to argue with fools. 
In fact, he even told you, avoid any conversation. Do not talk with a fool. Who's a fool? Anybody that doesn't see your greatness is a fool. Anybody that doesn't discern your value is a fool. Anybody that wastes your time is a fool. Here are some ways to escape bad conversations. One way is one moment. I have got another appointment and I've got to be there. And you probably got a thousand things or two. Give me your hand. Father, thank you for these moments we've had together. Let the words of our mouth bring glory to you. Bless Bill here and his wife, Sally. Let their marriage grow in grace and kindness. Amen. Thank you for these moments. I know you've got a I know you've got a schedule night or two. Bless you. And they're going to say, wait, 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 wait. Bless you. You must master escaping the unnecessary conversation in the ministry. Did I know that? No. You love everybody. You want to bless everybody, help everybody. And one day it hits you that everything you recommended was ignored and that 90% of all your recommendations were ignored. Let me move fast. His name? Tucson, Arizona. Had an Airstream travel trailer outside. I preached two hours. Then I sit on the platform and people come up by the droves, always wanting to talk, always wanting to share their story. And I love to listen to stories of people. But there comes a time that your goals are more important than anything in the world. You got to say no a hundred times to say yes to what's right once. One thirty in the morning, the pastor came up there, said, Brother Mike, I want to talk to you, son. I want to talk to you. He said, you see that long line? You just preached two hours what God told you to preach. You gave my people tonight the best you had from God. I said, yeah, I did. He said, then you sat here for three hours and met people, took pictures and talked, signed Bibles and listened to people's problems. Your wife is out there outside. She's been waiting for you three hours in y'all's little Airstream travel trailer. He said, Brother Mike, the people that I sent home were longer than the line you took care of for three hours. He said, you would be here till four o'clock in the morning, son, if I hadn't sent him home. And I just stared at him and I didn't know what to do. Real good man. I preach for him every year. East Side Assembly. He became the Assemblies of God Superintendent of Oval, Arizona. Smart, know it all, know it, smart. He said, Brother Mike, you gave people the best that you had. Son, you gave them the best that you had. And it still wasn't enough. They wanted to talk to you. He said, they didn't want your wisdom or they'd have been buying your books out here at the table. They wanted your attention, son. And there's a big difference between wanting your attention and wanting your wisdom. And almost no preacher ever grasped that. It took me well over 50 years of preaching to find out that wisdom is recognizing difference. Honor is rewarding someone for their difference.
Andrew just wrote me something I love. V-I-D-O-G-A-H. Lord, Andrew, I needed those words. This is a stream of healing. I can't tell you how important this is to me. Freddie, it is an honor to be in this class. Money can't buy this anointing. Freddie, V-D-B-E-R-G. These are extraordinary words. I can't tell you how valuable this is. Leanne Smiles says, assistance. If she changed her purse and turned it a certain way, she was done talking to this person and her assistant would interrupt. Precious time, linger is dangerous. I have done the same thing, Leanne. I've done the same thing. I didn't turn my purse around, but I say the same thing and that just helps me. Thank you for sharing that. Karen Renee, Wendell Graham. Stay away from false accusations. Don't get involved. A false accusation is a door. And you can never prove you didn't do something, didn't do it. I remember one night I got a lady left my apartment. And I got some feedback that somebody had seen a girl leave my apartment. Was it true? It's very true. My sister Deborah and her husband stayed inside. My sister Deborah left my apartment at 2 o'clock in the morning and there were people taking pictures and trying to catch me. I want so much to share with the other things. Billy Graham kept two men and more with him everywhere. He never entered a hotel room alone. Same thing with Dr. Paul. I want to get on writing books. Just keep a recorder with you at all times. At the moment you start saying something you think you'll want to remember, start taping it. It was years before I realized that it's, you can talk six times faster, four to six times faster than you can write. Writing's the slowest way to take information down. Father, I'm doing everything I can tell preachers this week how to protect their focus, how to nurture their families, how to make their wife their first ministry on the earth. Ten million people is not worth your wife, your husband. Father, as I share this week, every day, use this for your glory. Amen. Amen. I'll show you how to sow into our ministry if the Lord speaks to you. Steve Bennett, Dr. Brown, Tracy Singer, Gertrude, Apostle Sonia. Amen. These are ways if the Lord speaks to you. There's going to be two telephone numbers on the screen. We should have three tomorrow. We corrected our pray number. We have a number for prayer, and we've been having problems with it. I hope this blesses you. Tracy Singer, quote, the way you guide us from laughter to wisdom and order is beautiful. Tracy, you notice everything. I don't even notice that. Robert Walden said, I just called in my 112 covenant seed for 90 days. I feel strong about the seeds. Jill Rhodes Arkansas is here. I'm so thrilled that you're with me. Really take advantage of it. This is, I call this the preacher's handbook. And I'm going to say a lot of things that if you're not in the ministry, you may say, how can I apply? But it, you can. Those are the three numbers if you want to screenshot it. My staff is here eight hours a day, 11 to 7, 11 to 7 every day. My staff about 35 feet from me. And I'm thrilled today to have been with you two times. We're going to re-air, be a blessing to you. And I hope, I hope that you'll keep interceding for me. I asked the Lord for 77 
intercessors who would pray for me every single day called Covenant 77. And I can't thank you enough for standing with me. It means the world to me. Your 112 seeds comes out of the 112th Psalm. God guaranteed wealth. That's his word. God guarantee financial provision if you loved his laws. Father, I pray for seven harvests, financial wisdom, financial endorsement, financial discipline, financial protection, financial mentorship, financial favor, financial opportunities. I pray for seven harvests for every seed that's planted in the next 72 hours. Your sheep know your voice. Amen and amen. Family, when you sow into God's work, you're sowing because you love the kingdom, you love his wisdom, but don't forget to call in a harvest. Your seed is a command to your future to honor it. I was not raised knowing about that. But when my father was 80 years old, he preached over 60 years, built seven churches. He walked up to me after I shared my testimony to 125 pastors. He said, son, if somebody had taught your mother and me about prosperity the way God has taught you, he said, my whole ministry would have been completely different. Ignorance is dangerous. Ignorance impoverishes you. Don't you let anybody talk you out of the harvest. Money creates experiences, changes. Money stops pain. Money is a healer. Money unleashes rivers of gifts and love and caring. The purpose of money is joy. Don't ever let anybody talk you out of that. And when you sow to God, let me give you one testimony. I invested $25,000 in a man I greatly respect, Bill Gates. I really admire him. He was the richest man at $139 billion in America. Just before Elon Musk. And I study all rich men because I admire, I admire people who accomplish a lot. Admiration is the first seed for prosperity. You've got to admire someone who's done something you haven't done. Admire someone who hasn't. Anyway, I read one book by Bill Gates. It really changed my life. Business at the Speed of a Thought. Changed my whole ministry. Changed my entire ministry. I was 58 years old. I invested 25000 in his great company, Microsoft. About 13, 14 years later, I woke up and God said, take your money out of Microsoft. So I began to take my money back. They sent me back. This is my profit. I invested 25000 and I got back $19,600. What happened? I don't know. For some reason, I thought if I invested in Microsoft, I'd make a lot of money. I lost a lot of money. Then one day, the Lord told me to empty my savings account, 25000 and bless Oral Roberts. He held it in his hand. And within 72 hours, the heavens opened on my life. My $25,000 to Oral Roberts as a seed personally to him. He was a quite, a quite a man. People started buying me $75,000 cars, $100,000 cars, $120,000 brand new cars. People started blessing me. And I realized Jesus ain't a liar. Boy, that's a good title of a book. Jesus ain't a liar. Mark 10. You say, I don't know if I believe what Jesus said about throwing the phone. Well, then don't. Don't. No fussing. No quarreling. 
I just believe what Jesus said. And he told Peter, I'm going to give you a hundredfold back for every single penny you gave to the kingdom of God. He called it, actually, he called it territorial anointing. He said houses and lands. You don't have to believe that. You don't have to. But I do. I do. I've lost every dollar I've ever invested in mutual funds, every penny. Every penny, 250000 I've lost every nickel that I put in the world system. Maybe I just don't know anything about it. Maybe I'm not smart enough. But I am smart enough to believe the Holy Spirit. I'm smart enough for that. I love y'all family. David Emmanuel Mavis Adams is one of my C-77. Diana Brown, make a note of that. I've done it twice. She's, she sows her $112 seed auto-draft every month, every month, every month. Dr. Brown, twice when I prayed for you, I saw a 90-day turnaround. I saw a whole new group of patients in your, in your chiropractic clinic in 90 days. Just hit, it just hit me again when I said your name. Julie, thank you so much. Robert Walden, thank you. Father, I thank you for your blessing. Amen. Good night, folks. Love you. Now we'll see you, Pastor John Tracy Singer. Wow. Tracy Singer. Make a note of that. Tracy wants to bless me personally today. Do I believe in that the anointing can have an impartation? I sure do. Fifty-six people have become millionaires listening to my teaching through my ministry. My goal is 300. I don't want to die until 300, like Gideon's 300, you know. Let me just take a moment for my millionaires. I don't talk, but uh, money, money's fabulous. That's why you got to be careful you don't make it your God, because money... Well, if I want to get into the King James verbiage, money answereth all things. The Bible says that. And I believe every person who's anti-prosperity is a fool, a parasite, a fraudulent. Father, Bless my family. I've asked you to raise up 300 millionaires before I go home. I've got 56 so far. And I ask you, whoever's watching me tonight, help them to find the center of their assignment. Help them to create a gatekeeping system that nobody can agitate or destroy their focus on your goals for their life. Father, there's at least 12 preachers watching me now that hasn't written a book. And I didn't get to it tonight, but I want you to help me to, to really motivate them, inspire them, to write about their, their experiences, their disappointments, their mistakes, and most of all, their persuasions about you. Amen. Amen. Phil Hudgens, thank you. Jose, I will sow a 112 seed. I've asked the Lord for 76 who will sow a $112 seed three the next three months, once one three months in a row. I hope you're one of the 76. But I want you to journal what happens. I've asked the Lord for 76 people who will sow a $112 seed once a month for the next three months, but journal the reactions from God. Journal it. What came out of my 112 seed within weeks? One man gave me seven pieces of property. 
Another lady gave me a house in Arkansas and land. And another one, a land anointing came. A ter- I call it a territorial anointing came from the 112 seed. I don't know why. But land is a real key part of the money puzzle, the money world. Your land. Your land. God's going to give you real skills in your decision making. This $112 seed based on the 112th chapter of Psalm unleashed a, a river in my world. I hope you'll do it. Jose Cancel, one of the smartest things you'll ever do. One of the smartest things, the 112 seed. I'm also going to send the 112 partner. I'm going to send you some books in the coming weeks. And I'm going to send you some books, just, just sewing, because I know the power of the 112. And uh, you'll see. By the way, there's somebody sowing a $112 seed tonight in the next one hour. And you don't have my Bible, the Wisdom Bible. It's got 160 pages of all my private wisdom keys, my notes. If you're sowing a $112 seed tonight, please call these two numbers and say, Mike said that anybody sowing a $112 seed tonight would get a gift copy of the Bible, the Wisdom Bible. Anyone that's sowing the 112 seed for the next three months also ask for your gift copy of the Wisdom Topical Bible, 365 scriptures, a topic, 365 topics. It's book 216. 216, it's gorgeous, gold. Love you. Good night. See you tomorrow at 12 o'clock, the Lord willing. Call me before we close at 7 o'clock. Just take it out of me. I only want to be a pledge to you, Lord. Take it out of me. Thank you.